Okay. Let me just stop you just a second. Okay. All right. Before starting this, let me just remind you, thanks, Tom, that we have R plus PR, T plus, let me say T, is equal to RT and then E to the I delta R dot P over H bar minus I delta T H over H bar. So this is basically the kinematics. And this is what, this is the main thing that distinguishes quantum mechanics from classical mechanics, namely that momentum and energy, momentum operator and the energy operator, the Hamiltonian, generate translations in space and time. And if we're just talking about space, then R plus delta R is R. These are vectors, of course. R, this is E to the I delta R dot P over H bar. And for rotation, delta R is theta cross R, where theta is the axis of rotation. And the length of the vector theta is the number of radians in the rotation. And the rotation is a right-handed rotation. Okay. And, in fact, this is the same thing as R E to the I, of course, theta cross R dot P over H bar. And this is the same as R E to the I R cross P, or theta dot R cross P over H bar, which we normally write as R E to the I theta dot L over H bar. So that L, for orbital angular momentum, is just R cross P. So this formula for R cross P really follows from the basic rule about what a translation in space is. This is a point that's not usually emphasized in textbooks. In fact, I've never seen it in a textbook. Okay. Well, I just want to demonstrate now the Lie algebra of the rotation group. I did this last time. Most of you have seen it. I hope this time I don't screw it up. I got it right last time, so maybe I'll get it right this time. What we're going to do is we're going to have E to the minus I, let's say, delta LX. I'm absorbing the H bar in the delta. E to the minus I epsilon LY, E to the I delta LX, E to the I epsilon LY. If these things commuted, or if all the rotations were about the same axis, this would be unity. Instead, it is E to the I. It would turn out to be E to the I something of the order of epsilon delta LZ with possibly an H bar in there. I should have. Let me see what actually it will be. I think there's an H bar here, maybe. Okay. So, in other words, the succession of a right-handed rotation about the X axis, a right-handed rotation about the Y axis, a left-handed rotation about the X axis, a left-handed rotation about the Y axis, gives you altogether a left-handed rotation about the Z axis. And this is equivalent to the commutator LX with LY. We did the algebra last time, and the algebra is in my notes, which are on the line, is I H bar LZ. So this is the fundamental commutation we have in the manual dimension, and we can see it from this demo. So let me do the demo. The Y axis is this way. The Z axis is this way. This is the X axis. 
So if I do a rotation about the x-axis, let me put a little cheat mark on the top here so I know roughly how much to go. All right, here's the rotation right-handed about the x-axis. Okay, now we want to rotate about the y-axis. The y-axis is this way, uh, a right-handed rotation. So we get down to about there. And now <clears throat> I'm going to do a uh, left-handed a left-handed rotation about the x-axis. And now I'm going to do a uh, left-handed rotation about the y-axis. So right-handed would be this way, left-handed is that way. Roughly that. And you see what's altogether happened is a left-handed rotation about the z-axis. This pointer which was sticking out this way is now this way. And um, in fact, this I think has been the best demo I've done um, of this. It, it's, um, it's easy to, in doing four rotations, it's easy to do one bigger or smaller than one should. All right, well, so this is the uh, uh, commutation we want, and um, these L's are Hermitian operators. In fact, L is just R cross P. P is Hermitian, as is H, so L is clearly Hermitian. Um, we saw last time that if we, <coughs> that if we said that L, or if L was um, R cross P, then L sub I is um, a sum epsilon I J K R J P K, where we're summing here J K from one to three, and this epsilon one two three is one, and epsilon is totally anti-symmetric. It's called the Levy trivial symbol. Um, we saw last time that. Uh, since this is the case, um, for example, um, Lx is uh, R2 P3 minus R3 P2, etc. And we saw that uh, Lx Ly is IH bar Lz. This using the basic commutation relation that Xi Pj is IH bar delta Ij. This, of course, is fundamental commutation relation, which lies behind uh, this rule here. Okay, well, we did that last time, so I'm just reviewing that material. Um, okay, now something new that's related to the homework, which I t put on the web page. The web page, of course, is um, bio.fiz.com. UNN.edu slash 522. I said the homework would be due tentatively next Wednesday. Um, I think that's reasonable, but um, if there are screens from the graduate students, I'll defer it to the following week. Um, and of course, you can come see me anytime in my office down in the hall, or just you know, anytime you see me because I'm kind of rare before noon, um, but I'm here in the evenings. Um, and uh, you can ask questions about homework about the class. It's really important to ask questions in class um, if you have a question. I, so does anybody have a question? I, I forgot to bring the crackers today. Let me go get the crackers.
ICP ones that are lower in sodium. They don't taste as good. Anyway, the homework problem, some of them involve spin, and so let's look at the spin operators. The simplest example, well, I don't know if it's the simplest, but yeah, I guess it is the simplest example of these commutation relations, which I've written them here in XYZ notation, but a nicer notation is LI, LJ is I H bar, epsilon I J K, L K, again, summing over J and K from one to three. That's a nice way of writing them, but the general rule is J I, J J is I H bar, sum on J and K, epsilon I J K, J K. So this J is, these J's are commission operators that satisfy these commutation relations. Any one of them do will constitute an angular momentum. Well, let me say this. If it is an angular momentum, it has to satisfy that commutation relation. It will really be an angular momentum if it does, if it does rotate systems, which usually it does. Anyway, so an example of this is the Pauli matrices. Let me write them down. I don't go much for remembering things, but it turns out that it is useful, whoops, to memorize these, although I don't know if you actually have to memorize them. If you just do enough homework problems, you eventually memorize them. These are the Pauli matrices, and they satisfy the following product relation. Sigma I, sigma J is delta I J plus I sum epsilon I J K, sigma K. And there's no other factor there. So this is J K going from one to three, as usual. Okay. Well. Why is the sum on the J on the right and not on the left? Good point. Mistake here. Great. Thank you. My notes are right. I just didn't read them. So even more important than asking questions is pointing out mistakes that I make. And these mistakes become more rapid when I don't have the notes in front of me. When I put the notes down and think I know what I'm saying, then I wind up doing what Justice Marshall did on Tuesday. I got the oath wrong. All right. Well, let's see. By the way, one of the things that I suppose was wise, but in retrospect, I don't know if it really was. But you see, in quantum mechanics, what we've always done was we've – well, I guess it's inevitable. Anyway, we have this 1 over H bar everywhere. And so in order to have this 1 over H bar here – let's see. I think I ought to put this down because you guys can't see very well when it's up there. Because of this 1 over H bar here, we have to stick H bars in artificially up here. And now we want to see if this – if these spin operators satisfy this commutation relation. And the way we do that is to just say SI plus J. Well, this, of course, will be H bar squared over 4 because of the prefactors. And then it will be sigma I sigma J minus sigma J sigma I. And this then will be H bar squared over 
4 delta ij plus ih bar sum on k upon k to the k minus delta ij minus ih bar sum on k epsilon j i k sigma k. So that's what the commutator looks like. The delta ij terms obviously cancel. And so what we get is sigma i si sj equals, all right, let's put it in the notes, i h bar squared over 2 sum on k epsilon ij k sigma k. The point here is that the epsilon symbol is totally anti-symmetric, so if we interchange i with j, we get a minus sign which cancels that minus sign. So these two terms add, these two terms cancel, and we get this. And that is just i h bar sum on k epsilon ij k s k, where I pull the h bar over 2 out of this in order to promote sigma k to s k. So these operators here then do satisfy this commutation relation. And these are the appropriate operators for a spin 1 half system. All right, any questions? By the way, I was told, I was talking with a graduate student last night, and he said to me that graduate students kind of make fun of each other, and that this is why students didn't ask questions in class, that they were afraid that other graduate students would make fun of them. I think this is something that we really shouldn't, this ruins education. I didn't know what was going on. I never saw a graduate student myself. I'm not quite sure why, but we shouldn't do it. Okay, so this is the general commutation relation for annual momenta. These J's are all permission operators. And now, what do we call a vector? What we call a vector is something that under a rotation, a small rotation, turns into, behaves like a position operator. In other words, the change in the position operator was the delta R was theta cross R. Theta cross R, so this is like R. Here, I can do this. Theta cross R. So that's delta R. So that's what we mean by a vector. And what's true of vectors is that they satisfy this commutation relation. J I V J is I H bar sum on K epsilon I J K V K. So this is the commutation relation for a vector. And one thing that we realize from this definition, then, is that J itself is a vector. You see, because if we put V J here and V K there, that's just recapitulating this commutation relation, the fundamental one. So let's see what we mean by this. What we mean is that E to the I theta dot J over H bar V J E minus I theta dot J over H bar should be V J plus theta cross V sub J, where J is 1, 2, or 3. Now, this, of course, is the actual unitary rotation operator that does a right-handed rotation on a K sitting to the right of it. 
And uh, so what we're thinking of here is, in other words, if we put the state alpha here, then we can have alpha like that. And so the so effectively the value of V, the vector of the component Vj in the rotated state, the mean value of Vj in the rotated state is the mean value of Vj in the unrotated state plus the mean value of this rotated change in the state. Um, anyway, uh, getting rid of these now for the moment. What we have is that this is Vj plus... Now, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm expanding this to um, in, in a power series and just keeping the uh, first term. So I'm thinking of an, an infinitesimal rotation. And this is going to be i theta i over h bar sum i equals 1 to 3 j i v j. So that's all of this. And this is then v j. And now let me get this right. This is Vj. Okay, let me follow my notes. Vj minus epsilon ijk theta i vk i l equals one. Um, yeah, you see, this thing sub j would have a j here and an i there, and I interchanged them, so I generated a minus sign. This is perhaps, in other words, this thing is bj plus some um, epsilon j i k theta i. Okay, and that's the same as this. Because epsilon is totally inestimate. J i goes to i j. Okay, so dropping the vj's from both sides and um, say differentiating with respect to theta i, what we get is let me go over here to say blackboard space i over h bar. J i v j is minus the sum on k epsilon i j k v k or j i v j is i h bar sum on k epsilon i j k v k. Okay, so this, so what we've said here is if the vec, if this, these operators v k v j three of them, transform like this under a rotation, then they satisfy this commutation relation, which is the, which is the same thing as, as that. And, and in fact, it's, it's if and only if. If they satisfy this, then you can go back up and you can write this at least for infinitesimal theta. Any questions? What's the L? Yeah. What the L? You have IL equal on your summation. Right. Where, 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 on, where? Uh, on your V times. Yes, yeah, this thing here. I, I, yeah, I. That's a, uh, that's a good point. IK. Well, thank you. I've got, um, here. Sure. I've got small treats that I that I don't have, a, of course, a huge pocket full of candy, but I've got a couple more so that anybody who asks a question makes a correction. Oh, actually, you made a correction. You want chocolate or mint? Well, I've got one mint left. All right. 
So what we've seen then is that this rule here says that V transforms like a vector under rotations. And that's what we mean by a vector. Okay, what we mean by a scalar is something that doesn't change under rotations. And what we can show now is that if we... So in other words, a scalar is something that does this. All right. Now, suppose that V is a vector and U is a vector. Then what I want to show is that V dot U is a scalar. And that is to say I want to show that it satisfies this computation relation. So we have JI VJ is I H bar sum on K X1 I J K V K We have JI U J is I H bar sum on K X1 I J K V K So these are the two rules that say that V and U are vectors. And now what we want to do is consider the commutator of V of JI with a sum on J U J V J. And this will be a sum on J of JI U J V J. And now way back here I'm going to write minus U J V J J I. You might wonder why is writing the commutator as just a drawn out way. Well what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick in here minus U J J I V J and plus U J J I V J. And now you see what we've got is the sum on J of the commutator J I V J times V J plus U J times the commutator J I V J. And now this is because these satisfy these two. Because U and V are vectors that satisfy these commutation relations. What we have is I H bar a sum now on J and K of epsilon I J K. And in fact I can combine them as U K V J plus U J V K. Okay. So now actually I shouldn't have combined them. That was that makes it so let me uncombine them. This is then a sum I H bar sum on J and K of epsilon I and in fact what I'm going to do with the first one is I'm going to take this as I I'm going to I'm going to rename J and K. So I'm going to call this thing K J U J V K plus and then the second term will be just epsilon I J K U J V K. So I've just you see J and K are dummy indices and so they don't care what we call them and so we can rename them K J instead of J K as long as we do it everywhere. Now what we've got is we've got the same or now I can factor it to make a little more sense. Sum on J K so then we have epsilon I K J plus epsilon I J K times U J V K. Okay well these two things obviously add to zero because whatever this is this is minus it because it's one permutation of K with J and so this is zero. So in fact 
what we have is that GAI, you got the zero. So this is a scalar. All right, so that's the end of the notes on rotations. I added more of my notes to the web page, and that's the next topic, namely the algebra of the rotation group. By the way, in case any of you want to register for the course, the CRN is 36885, and it's 522.004. All right, now, group theory is a subject that can be arbitrarily sophisticated. And from the point of view of physics, that sophistication is usually a waste of time. What's much easier than group theory is the Lie algebra, and that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit as we work out what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are of operators, of angular momentum operators. I'm going to put a link to some of my notes on group theory and Lie algebras. I meant to do that last night, but I forgot. So it would just be chapter two of the class notes for the course 466. The basic idea here is if you have a group G, and you have group elements G1 and G2 that are in the group, and you have G1 times G2 equals G3, then you can have a map from G into matrices D of G. And if you have D of G1, D of G2 equals D of G3, then this is called a representation of the group. And the representations that we like are the representations where these things are square matrices, and by the way, a group, of course, is just something that's closed under multiplication, has an identity, so that if G1 is in the group, G2 is in the group, then the product G3 has to be in the group. That's closed under multiplication. There's, of course, an identity. G1 times E is G1. They write it as E for some reason. It's associative, and this is an inverse. So for any G, there's a G inverse. That's the identity. Now, when the groups, for groups like the rotation group and various other groups, SU2, SU3, SU4, the symplectic groups, the orthogonal groups, these vary, and the exceptional groups, these groups are compact groups. These groups have representations that are not only square, they're actually unitary matrices. And so we will want to look for unitary matrices such that D actually P is equal to the square identity matrix. And so that's what we're talking about. And these Js, we satisfy this computation relation. What one can do is one can say that D of, and now let me use for this, or represent the theta, represent the group element by the angle that specifies the rotation. Then this is E to the minus I theta dot J over H bar. And now if this is a matrix that's square and permission, so in other words, 
straight diabetes from Australia. We'll be taking the train with us and square. Um, uh, we want to, and if these J's satisfy this commutation relation, then these D's will form a representation of the rotation group. And um, these matrix elements of uh, this matrix will be identifying with various matrix elements of rotations in various states um, uh, of various eigenstates of J and J Z. Anyway, that was a bit of a uh, tangent. Uh, is there any question about that? Or any other questions? Do you have any questions? I think we're raising the So, any questions? All right, well, we've seen that. Uh, all right, let me ask you a question then. What's that? Right, zero. You get the name. All right, um, so the rest of the treats are just going to have to be crackers. All right, um, so we know that J will commute with J squared. And um, well, what does that mean? This thing is certainly Hermitian. These guys are Hermitian. And so what we can do is we can choose to form simultaneous eigenstates. This is a quantum class, not a math class. We can choose to form simultaneous eigenstates of J squared. This is J squared. And one of the J's. We can't do all of them because no two commute. And what people do conventionally, of course, is they take J3. Um, I don't know why. Um, let's define J plus as J1 plus I J2 and J minus as J1 minus I J2. These are the raising and lowering operators. And um, um, now what we're going to do is we're going to prove a sequence of very simple theorems, but there are several of them. And so this is going to take the rest of the, the rest of today's class to prove these various theorems. Um, but they're important theorems. You may have seen them in undergraduate quantum mechanics. You probably had, but it's good to see them again. All right. Well, first of all, J3 with J plus, what would this be? Well, this is J3 with J1 plus I J2. And um, so what is that? That is I H bar epsilon 3, 1, 2 J2 for this one. And we don't really need to sum because since this is totally anti-symmetric, once you have the first two positions fixed, there's only one possible choice for the third position. And then this one is minus h bar, because we have two factors of i, epsilon 3, 2, 1, j 1. And so altogether that is i h bar j 2 minus i j 1. By the way, these notes are online, so you don't really need to kind of, you don't really need to, well, sometimes I make extemporaneous remarks like this, but by and large, Almost everything I write on the board is on these notes. So you don't really have to count Anyway, this is h bar times j1 plus i j2. And so this is h bar j plus. So this rule that one, one thing that we want to we'll use later is j3 j plus is h bar um, j plus. And this I'm going to call this equation five. And then draw the box 
This is one of them. One of them. See, these theorems are all simple, but there are so many of them that after a while you might get tired. All right, now let's try J3 with J minus. Well, this is J3 with J1 minus I J2. This is I H bar epsilon 3, 1, 2, J2, and then plus All right, let me do it in full detail. Minus I, J3 with J2, is I H bar epsilon 3, 2, 1, J1. And so this is H bar 3, 2, 1. If I can tell that's a minus sign, and so that's H bar minus J1, and this is a plus sign, so this is plus I J2. And so this is minus H bar J minus. So we have another relation here, namely J3 J minus is minus H bar J minus. This one is 6. This is a box on that edge. All right, so this is the second of the theorems. Now, theorem 3 is J plus J minus. And so this is equal to J1 plus I J2, J1 minus I J2. And now J1 is J1, J2 is J2, so what we really have here is minus I J1, J2 plus I J2, J1. And this is then minus 2I J1, J2. Remember that if you have a commutator that's like this, J2, J1, it is equal to minus the commutator of J1 with J2. Because the commutator is AP minus PA. So we get two of those, and that is then minus 2I times I H bar epsilon 1, 2, 3, J3. And so altogether, that is 2H bar J3. So now we have the commutation relation that J plus with J minus is 2H bar J3. This is from the equation 7, and this is worth a lot of salt. That's basically P3. By the way, you notice that just the way the name gives. It turns out that Gibbs was a professor at Yale, and he was completely unappreciated by his fellow faculty members at Yale. And in fact, for some years, he wasn't even paid. He was just teaching, he wasn't paid. And after he died, some famous German physicist named Nernst came to visit Yale. And he got off the train and he was met by the chemistry and physics. Professor of chemistry and physics, they wanted to take him to lunch at Maury's. And he said, first, before lunch, I wanted to pay my respects at the monument to J. Willard Gibbs. And they were all embarrassed because it was no monument to J. Willard Gibbs. And uh, so there are two versions of the story. One is that he got back on the train to New York. The other is that he um, established a monument of his own to Gibbs. Oh, any questions about this? I mean, not about the story. About the okay, now let me um, ask you some questions here. J squared with J plus. What's that going to be? Yes. I'm out of candy. And that's 
because this is a J1 plus IJ2. Well, J1 can have a non-zero commutative with vector, but not with a scalar. And the same thing with J2. J2 tries to rotate this, but the scale is E just at zero. So the same thing can be said for J minus. And in fact, for that matter, oh, gee, I am doing something really stupid here. This is a square, OK? OK, so what I meant here was this is supposed to be J squared. And I guess I So this is J squared. It's a scalar. It's like you got V. So it, since it's a scalar, it commutes with J plus, J minus, and J3, as well as J1 and J2. So those are all zero. OK, now let's consider just the products J plus, J minus. This is J1 plus I, J2. J1 minus I, J2. And this is J1 squared plus J2 squared minus I, the commutator J1, J2. And so this is J1 squared plus J2 squared. And then this is minus I, I, H bar. And it's epsilon 1, 2, 3, J3. And so this is just J3. OK. And so what we have is an important relation, actually. J plus J minus is equal to J1 squared plus J2 squared plus H bar J3. And I don't know if we need a box, so I'll make a box. And this is number nine. So that's an important relation. And similarly, if you use J minus J plus, this is equal to J1 minus I J2, J1 plus I J2. And this is equal to J1 squared plus J2 squared. And now what we get is plus I J1 J2. And this is then J1 squared plus J2 squared. And this is plus I I H bar J3. And so what we have is J minus J plus is equal to J1 squared plus J2 squared uh, minus H bar J3. And I guess I'll call this 10. All right. So that's um, that. Let me get a drink. By the way, Gibbs' father was a lawyer, and he was the principal defense lawyer for the Africans who um, mutinied on the slave ship and wound up in Connecticut. Um, this was a story that was... Um, well, the story of this was made into a movie Get the name of the movie. Huh? Yes. Anyway, so that was Gibbs' father was the counselor, and he won the case. Okay, so what we have is uh, J plus J minus is J squared minus J3 squared plus H bar J3. So that's taking equations 9 and 10 and just 
putting a um, adding and subtracting j3 squared. And j minus j plus is j squared um, minus j3 squared minus h bar j3. So these are important uh, relations. And we can then rewrite j squared as 1 half j plus j minus plus j minus j plus plus j3 squared. Because if we add these two together, uh, the j3 terms cancel. And um, so we get the sum of these two is 2j squared uh, minus 2j3 squared. And then dividing through by 2, you get this. So this is um, an important uh, rule. OK, any questions? All right, now let's consider psi b to be some normalized state and take the mean value in the state psi of j squared, which is j dot j. And this is sum on k of psi jk squared psi. And this is certainly positive because sum on k of this is, in other words, psi jk times jk psi. And so it's a sum on k of the norm of the vector jk psi. And that is greater than or equal to zero. So we know that the norm, that the mean value of any normalized state of j squared is positive. That means that now we want to find eigenvalues here of j squared and of j3. And so what we know then is the eigenvalues of j squared must be positive. And we're going to set these eigenvalues to, we're going to call them uh, we're going to call we're going to call the eigenstates J M, and we're going to call these things simply uh, J J plus one H bar J M, and we're going to say J three on J M is H bar J H bar M. Okay. Now, this is just a convenient representation of a positive eigenvalue. If, if in fact, this thing is just simply alpha jm, where alpha is greater than or equal to zero, then um, then you can solve a quadratic equation for j in terms of alpha, and you see you get two solutions, one with positive j, one with negative j. And so uh, for any positive eigenvalue of j squared, there's a unique positive j. And if alpha is 0, then j is 0. So this is a representation, an appropriate representation of non-negative eigenvalues of j squared in terms of j. We don't know what j is at the moment, uh, but we just know that uh, j is greater than equal to zero. We don't know anything about m at the moment, and we only know so far about these things from this rule here. We know that uh, this eigenvalue alpha is non-negative, and so j can be chosen to be non-negative. So that's how we're going to be representing things, and we want to find out um, what J is and what M is from the commutation relations. And that one can do this is one of the uh, consequences of Lie algebra. And um, that's the nice thing about Lie algebra. You can figure out basically everything about the um, representations of the uh, of compact groups 
uh, if you work hard enough with uh, these simple algebraic relations. The theorem is very much like the one that we went on before. <coughs> okay, so we want to solve these two equations, which I guess uh, I can call 20 and 21. But the first thing we want to show is that minus j is less than equal to m is less than j. In other words, that m lies somewhere between j and minus j. And the way we do that, I mean, can you guys see if I write here? I guess you can see what if I write here. All right. So let me do that. Zero, we know zero is less than the norm of the operator j plus on this state jn, which is an eigenstate. I don't mean the faculty member jn, I don't mean uh, jn. Um, this thing is jm, j minus j plus jn, because uh, this thing is j plus adjoint, in other words, j minus j plus adjoint. And moreover, j minus j plus, we have a formula for it here. And so this is jm, and it's the mean value of j squared, the vector, minus j3 squared, minus h bar j3, jm. And now these states, JM, state jm is an eigenvector of all three of these operators. And, and moreover, we're assuming jm is normalized. Uh, so this thing is equal to j, j plus 1, h bar squared. In fact, let me factor out the h bar squared. j, j plus 1, minus m squared, minus m times h bar squared. The j, j plus 1 comes from here, the m squared from here, and m from there. Now, this thing is actually equal to h bar squared j minus m j plus m plus 1. And we know then that this is greater than or equal to 0. Well, if m were bigger than j, we know j is positive. So if m were bigger than j, m would be positive. j plus m plus 1 would be positive. But if m were bigger than j, this term would be negative. But we know the thing is positive. So that tells us that m cannot be bigger than j. So we've proven this. In fact, we can refactor this thing as h bar squared j minus m plus 1 j plus m. So again, we're just playing with this structure here. We factorize it as this and then as that. And, oh wait a minute, I'm sorry, I skipped something in my notes. In order to get this, we don't just refactorize that. In order to get this, uh, what we do is we um, take, we know that 0 is less than or equal to j minus on jm squared. And this is jm, j plus j minus jm. And this then is uh, by using the j plus j minus ones from up here, this one is mean value of j squared minus j3 squared plus h bar j3 jm. And now this one is equal to this. Um, it's j squared minus m squared plus m times h bar squared. That can be factored to this. And now um, we know that j is positive. Um, Wait a minute. How, what are we? Right. Now, we know that J is positive. Suppose now that M were negative. If M, are ne is, if M is negative, this structure is positive. But if M is negative, that's fine as long as it's small, as, as long as it's 
magnitude is not greater than j. But when m exceeds, or when m is more negative than minus j, then this term becomes negative. And that violates this inequality. So that proves this part of the inequality. So what we know then is that m lies between minus j and plus j. All right, any questions about that? Um, all right, so we're going to have a bit of time out here while we do some erasing. Okay, so we're once again starting with these two equations. J m is an eigenvector of j squared with this eigenvalue, and j3 with this eigenvalue. And so far, only we know that all, all we know is that j is non-negative and lies within this range. Um, so now we want to set m equal to minus j, and we want to see that j minus on j minus j is equal to zero. And we also want to say, want to see that uh, if m is greater than minus j, but of course less than, less than j, um, that j squared j minus j squared j minus on jm is equal to a bar squared j j plus 1 j minus jm and the j3 on j minus the j3 j minus jm is m minus 1 h bar j minus j n. Okay, so these two things are what we want to prove. Now, we saw before that j minus j m squared was h bar squared j minus m plus 1 j plus m. So if we set m equal to minus j, this is 0. And that means then that this is 0. And so we have j minus j minus j is in fact 0. So that, uh, that proves this equation here. Yeah. All right. Now, we know by a, or simply by the fact that j squared is a scalar, we know that j squared, j minus, is zero. And consequently, well, here, I just probably skip some of the equations. Consequently, j squared, j minus, on the state jm, is equal to zero. On the other hand, that is equal to j squared j minus jm minus j minus j squared jm equal to zero. Okay. Now, j squared on jm by assumption is h bar squared jj plus one on jm. And so this says the j squared j minus jm is equal to h bar squared j j plus 1 j minus j 
change. So that proves this relation here. And this, this is something that's very common in mathematical physics. When you've got a commutation relation like this, uh, and you've got a state that's an eigenstate of one of these operators, then the fact that the commutator is zero allows you to write j, j squared j minus on the state as the eigenvalue times j minus on that state. That then tells us that this state is an eigenstate of j squared with the same eigenvalue. And so j minus on the state jm is also an eigenstate of j squared with the same eigenvalue as jm. In other words, h bar squared j, j plus 1. OK, so we've proven then uh, these two relations. Now, um, now what we want to do is prove another one of these theorems. I don't know how many of them there are, but Okay, so we're going to continue here to assume that m is greater than minus j. And uh, we know that j3 is j minus is minus h bar j minus. That's um, one of these commutation relations. I don't remember which one. And that tells us then that j3 j minus on jm is minus h bar j minus on jm. But that means then that j3 j minus jm is equal to j minus j3 jm minus h bar j minus jm. But jm is an eigenvector of j3, and so this is j minus h bar m jm minus h bar j minus jm. And so altogether this is h bar m minus 1 j minus jm. OK. So that tells us that j3 j minus on jm is equal to that. So now if we write out parentheses like this, we see that j minus on the state jm is an eigenvector of j3 with eigenvalue h bar m minus 1. So it's down 1 uh, on the um, ladder. Well, we're basically out of time. Um, what we'll do next time is repeat the same thing for j plus and then go on and um, and uh, do um, to the rest of the Lie algebra rotations. And then uh, after that, the next topic is, the topic is uh, orbital angular momentum and spherical coordinates. So we'll want to uh, see how orbital angular momentum looks in terms of uh, spherical coordinates, which will enter if we consider spherically symmetric potentials like hydrogen-like atoms. Then we have to do the addition of angular momentum. And um, once we've done that, then we'll be basically done with angular momentum and we can go on to <coughs> central potentials and perturbation theories and other things. Um, it's great that you point out mistakes and um, answer my questions, but it would be good if good if people ask more questions because when one person asks a question it normally answers the question that is puzzling somebody else. Yes. I do have one. Good. Um, so 
What we've been doing is we've been doing we've been working on the Lee algebra of uh, of the group SU2 or and also the group SO3. They have the same Lee algebra. And um, these groups have many different representations and each representation has a somewhat different Lie algebra because the representation you see the representation can be a square matrices but they can be two by two as if you use those Pauli matrices or they can be three by three if you use the ordinary rotation matrices that I was illustrating with the big black ball or they can be just uh, 2j plus 1 by 2j plus 1 dimensional matrices which is for a particle or a system of spin j so the Lie algebra is the useful part of group theory. I mean, apart from the other simple aspects of group theory that are useful, but um, much of group theory just goes off in a terribly mathematical direction, which is um, hopeless. Did I answer your question? I'm sorry. All right. Well, give me the part, ask the part that, you, that I didn't answer. I guess I, I still don't really know what a Lie algebra is. Okay. Well, let's see. This stuff I erased. Um, basically, you have this D of G, and if G is close to the identity. Then this thing is equal to the identity plus um, I times some parameters, say um, epsilon sub A, times some generated, which for the case of rotations are the JA, but uh, more generally they'd be some other. Uh, you use some other symbol for them. In other words, more generally, you'd say I plus I epsilon A G sub A for a general group. And now, what is true? Well, you can show that in general, in fact, you can show by something very much like the demo that the G A G B, the commutator of two generators, has to be some sort of a linear combination. I, F, A, B, C, G, C of the other generators. So, so the, the, this, these commutation relations are, the Lie algebra is all linear combinations of the generators. That's the algebra. And there's a product rule that's closed. If you take the commutator of two elements of a Lie algebra, you stay in the Lie algebra. <laughs> So that's basically, so this is the Lie algebra, and the J i j k equals i epsilon i j k j k, that is uh, the Lie algebra for SU2 and SO3, those groups. And um, you then, once you have something like this, you can then work out all kinds of relations, very much like the ones we're doing here for this specific case. Right. So do you know how to turn that thing off? <laughs>